Okay, uh, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the first uh, lecture, first session of our uh, Open Dias project, which we have started with uh, our lab recently. Uh, the goal of this project is to uh, actually provide interesting lectures from uh, people who have interesting topics to the students. And uh, we are collecting lectures from all around the world. And uh, we are interested to share our experience with the students from different universities, different parts of the world, and so on. Uh, in general, uh, idea of this project was uh, proposed by uh, the students last semester, uh, whom I was teaching. And they say that, uh, so why not uh, to create something uh, where we can share experience, where we can invite uh, different speakers. And uh, that's how we came up with uh, an idea of uh, the Open Dice project. And uh, then I start growing when I start communicating our partners and friends of our laboratory in different universities in different countries. And also we decided that uh, why we need to have a lectures only for the students which we have on our side. So that's why we started to share uh, the information about this kind of virtual conference to the people in different universities. And uh, finally, today, I was really surprised to see uh, about 60 uh, registrations. So and I see that already 48 people joined. And I see that uh, people continue to join this uh, meeting. And we made some uh, posted information about this on Twitter and LinkedIn. And uh, I think that's why, for example, among the people who registered, I see uh, more countries uh, registering uh, for this event that's, uh, than I have a contact in. Uh, I was surprised to see uh, the people registering from France, from Italy. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now just to couple words about myself. Uh, I'm from St. Petersburg, from Russia, from Itmo University. So I uh, made here my master's degree and PhD. And currently, I'm a postdoc here and uh, working as associate professor. And also, I'm working in the industry of software development for already many years, for almost 15 or even. And so uh, I was. Uh, working with the giants like uh, Motorola, which later became Motorola Mobility. It was Google and then Iris. And uh, also from 2014, I'm working with uh, Oracle Corporation and working for this uh, company doing different interesting things. And uh, starting 2006, uh, I'm working uh, in Itmo University. So teaching there first as uh, assistant, uh, then um, teacher, tutor. So now I'm an associate professor. So I was leading different courses. Uh, and now we came to having our own lab, which is called uh, Cosm Cloud Oriented Solutions and uh, Modeling Lab. Uh, so today we will talk about uh, uh, complex system and why they are failing because uh, in my research work I'm working a lot with the computer modeling and uh, the computer modeling is actually my primary topic which uh, I'm working with and uh, when you're dealing with the computer modeling you need to frequently and almost always deal with the complexity with the complex system with the complex uh, let's say event or uh, something like this and uh, when you're working with such things, you're starting to think a lot about what this complexity is and uh, how the complex things are actually uh, happening, how they build off, and also what what the meaning of the failure in the complex system. We will start uh, with a few words about Hegel and his dialectics and how it is affecting the software engineering. Uh, we will also look at the signs of the complexity of systems, uh, which were introduced by Grady Bush. Uh, we will also take a look at the hierarchical compensations rule, which was introduced by Russian scientists uh, Evgeny Sidov. And uh, then we will go through some uh, interesting points uh, introduced by uh, Dr. Cook 
about uh, the reasons how the complex system fail and what uh, it, what it means for for the system. Uh, let's start from uh, the dialectics from Hegel, uh, and uh, I think that everybody knows that um, dialectics is also known as uh, dialectical method, and it, this is a discourse between two or more people holding different points of view about the subject, but wishing to establish the truth uh, through their reasoning arguments. Uh, so there are actually several very pretty concepts which are uh, actually galaxies based on, like everything is transient and finite existing in the medium term. Everything is composed of contradictions or opposing forces. Uh, gradual changes lead to crises, turning points when one force overcome its opponent force and uh, changes is inherical. Uh, so these uh, concepts of uh, dialectics are actually very uh, applicable when we're dealing with uh, software engineering in uh, particular and uh, in a complex system in, in general, because we can frequently see that uh, the behavior of the system, whatever it is, it's actually pretty, uh, in, in, in most cases, it's uh, interaction of different forces. And these forces are trying to overcome one another or uh, Actually, the behavior of uh, the whole system is uh, pretty much the synergy of uh, different forces which are com coming to play. And when we're trying to uh, think about uh, how the complex system work, how it is actually, uh, is, is it working correctly or is, it, uh, is there any, uh, is there any de uh, deviations of the behavior? We need to understand that there are always many different forces and many different uh, parts coming at play, and uh, they are trying to actually uh, deal somehow with each other. And so uh, when we are looking at the system, it's never uh, in the same state. So it's always uh, changing state from one to another. So it's always evolving, it's always, uh, built with uh, contradictions and so on. So, and uh, th th that, that is why uh, dialectical principles are very well describing what's happening pretty much in, uh, in a com complex systems. Uh, the next uh, important person I want to draw your attention is the Grady Bush. Uh, he done a lot for the software engineering area and uh, he actually one of those who developed uh, unified modeling language UML, which is uh, right now used in many, many different areas. Uh, and uh, not only in software engineering, but uh, in, in really large amount of uh, different areas. Uh, he was working with uh, Ivor Jacobson and James Roomba. And uh, besides the UML, he also developed and introduced a lot of interesting things, which are uh, right now, the fundamentals of the software engineering, how we know it for today. And so Grady Wush introduced several uh, attributes of the complex systems like hierarchic structure, uh, the relative primitives, separation of concerns, uh, common practices, and uh, stable intermediate forms. So right now we will go through uh, all these items, how they are described by Grady Bush, and we will try to maybe comment somehow how these uh, principles are actually applicable to some real systems. First is the hierarchic structure. All systems have subsystems and all systems are part of larger systems. The value added by a system must come from the relationship between the parts, not from the parts per se. So it means that uh, when we are dealing with uh, some uh, a complex system, we're never trying to get uh, its functionality, we never try to make use for its uh, separate parts. We're always trying to uh, make it working as a whole. So for example, if we will take a car, we are not trying to think about the value of a wheels of an engine or some maybe uh, embedded computer, which is driving all this stuff. We're trying to use it as a car in a whole. So that is why we are trying to uh, be focused on uh, the system itself, not uh, on its parts, which are actually built in a hierarchical way. Uh, the next part is a relative primitives. So the choice of the components in the system are primitive is relatively arbitrary and is a large, 
it is largely up to the discretion of the observer of the system. So here it's about, this is very important thing which we are actually uh, relying on when we doing the, for example, system design or when we're trying to build the model of the system. So we're never trying to uh, actually address very details, for example, from scratch when we're designing the system. Because uh, in this case, we are getting too much information to process. So that is why we're trying to uh, look at the system, let's say layer by layer, when we can do the high level uh, sketches of it when, in the very beginning, then we can get deeper in details of a particular part or a particular subsystem and get more information about it. So design the parts of this subsystem, then we can go back to the higher level and uh, take next uh, part of the system and start uh, drilling deeper into the details of uh, this actually uh, part. And uh, so, yeah, uh, this uh, the important attribute of the complex system. So if we can uh, easily vary the level of the digitalization, which we are actually uh, looking at the system, that means that we are most probably dealing with a complex system. Uh, next is uh, separation of the concerns. Intercomponent linkage are generally stronger than intercomponent linkage. The fact has that the effect of separating the high frequency dynamics of the components involving the internal structure of the components from the low frequency dynamics involving interaction among components. So uh, this means that uh, when we are trying to build uh, actually the system from many different integrated parts, so the relationships which we have inside these parts much stronger than the relationships which we are having between these components. Uh, this actually allow us to make kind of functional uh, clusterization, which is, uh, uh, yeah, and th th this is an attribute of the complex system. So if we see that uh, the, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, when we see that the system is built from several clusters, which are tightly coupled comparing to loosely coupled parts. So most probably this is an attribute of the, and we're dealing with a complex system. The next thing is a common part. Uh, patterns that uh, hierarchic system are usually composed only of few different kinds of subsystems in various combinations and arrangements. Uh, that uh, works pretty well for, for example, software systems, and uh, maybe it's not that uh, well fits uh, other kinds of real world systems because they can be pretty diverse. But uh, in any way, so this is uh, what we also pretty frequently observe uh, when we're dealing with, with the systems. And uh, the last one is uh, the stable intermediate forms, it means that a complex system that works uh, invariably found uh, to have evolved from a simple system that worked. A complex system designed from uh, scratch never works and cannot be patched on make it working. You have to start over beginning with a working simple system. This is more uh, like kind of evolutionary principle when we're developing uh, the complex system. It means that when we're trying to solve the complex problem, or we want to build a model of the complex system, or we want to design uh, the complicated software product. Uh, we need to actually start from something simple and do the, do the work incrementally. So we can start from uh, basics, then we can see that, okay, so the basic layer is working, we can enhance it, add more to it, and another functionality, add new relationships, and so on and so on. So this is very related to how, for example, we are building the models of the systems because we also, whenever we try to, you know, take a complex system and build a model it's from scratch, we are trying to actually uh, evolve the model. So we are doing, we're adding the basic uh, modules or basic uh, nodes. Then we introduce uh, simple links between them. Then we enhancing and enhancing this system until we are getting you know, something what looks like what we're trying to model. And uh, uh, this evolutional way allow us to have more uh, stable and reliable and predictable result over time of what we are doing and uh, how this is actually happening. Uh, 
Next uh, section will be dedicated to work of uh, Evgeny Antonovich Sidov, who is a Russian scientist. And he actually done a lot in uh, space and terrestrial communication areas. So uh, he was working at uh, building the devices and systems in ultrasonic range, hypersonic communications. And so, so actually his works uh, can be met pretty frequently in these areas of technologies. And he introduced uh, the law, which is uh, uh, called hierarchical compensation law. And it sounds like this. The growth of the diversity at the top level of hierarchical organization is ensured by limiting diversity of the previous level. And increased diversity of the lower level destroys the top level of the organization. Uh, actually, we see that this law works perfectly in the real world, so we can find a very large number of examples where uh, this is actually applicable and where this actually works. For example, the good example here is uh, the area of uh, the mobile devices development. If we will talk, I'll take a look at uh, the mobile devices as they were maybe 15 years back, we will saw that we have you know hundreds of the devices so there are a lot of vendors and each vendor have its own operating system and uh, we see a lot of you know different applications running on each particular device we see a lot of uh, specific stuff done for the devices but the problem at that moment was that since every every vendor of mobile phones uh mostly mobile phones because uh, tablets were not in place yet. So we see that mobile phones uh, have their own applications and uh, the number of actually applications which are running on these phones was pretty limited. And it was not the problem that uh, these uh, mobile devices were not uh, powerful enough or uh, there was not enough uh, developers who are working on the applications development. No, there was a giant number of uh, uh, software vendors uh, who, was, who were trying to, you know, make their applications for this working on particular platforms or uh, making them working on set of platforms, for example, like uh, operating systems from Samsung, from Nokia, there was a Symbian, and so some other vendors like Sony Ericsson and so, so they all have their own software platforms and uh, many companies which uh, were developing commercial software were trying to port it from one phone to another. And this haven't worked well, just because uh, the level of uh, the platforms was very diverse. What we have now, so we see that we have two, three uh, mobile platforms, like uh, we have Android, we have uh, iOS, sometimes we still have some other mobile application platforms like mobile Ubuntu, we have uh, maybe some Windows phones still running, uh, but we have a huge number of applications on top of this. That means that we reduced, uh, we reduced uh, diversity on the level of the devices, and this allow us to increase the diversity on the top level, on the level of applications. And uh, also this is working in very many areas. For example, if we go uh, back in the history and we saw that uh, when we were trying to, uh, the industry was trying to develop different CPUs uh, for, for the computers. So there were also, you will need to have different applications. There were a lot of different stuff you need to do for this. Uh, if you have this kind of CPU or that kind of CPU. So right now this, all the stuff is streamlined. So we have just a couple of vendors which are providing the general, general purpose CPUs like we have on our machines. So. We have something from Intel, we have something from AMD, but uh, they are pretty aligned with each other. And uh, that's why we actually have the gentleman of software running on top of this. And because uh, we, uh, we reduced the level of diversity on the bottom level. And uh, this is actually the part of the evolution because uh, when we're introducing the new layer of uh, almost any organization, technical organization, we can see that uh, First of all, we are getting the huge number of uh, solutions which are coming on, on top of uh, the previous layer, which we already have. And when this layer, new layer coming to some maturity level, uh, then we can see that uh, only the few uh, actual applications or few elements of this level became 
widely used due to different reasons. So we need to uh, clearly understand that the reasons which are which are behind the selection of this platform or another, uh, pretty frequently they're different. So it's not only like, you know, the nature of selection because uh, uh, so this solution was really better than that solution. That's why we take this. And actually everybody takes this. No, pretty frequently we see that uh, solutions are selected just because uh, the marketing of one solution was actually better than another. So that's why more people are starting using this. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, some, let's say, uh, decisions uh, the world come with uh, are pretty arguable. And uh, but we can see that uh, so this is how the evolution of our system works. And this is what was chosen by most of the people. And uh, that's why we have experience which we have, for example, delivered right now. For example, uh, we can take uh, the selection of uh, the version control systems, right? Uh, we have uh, two pretty close competitors, like we have uh, the Git and we have Mercurial, which are almost pretty the same. But uh, let's say I see that Mercurial have some uh, very important uh, benefits of using over Git, because for example, in Mercurial, one person can't actually destroy the repository because uh, the commits which you put in the repository are completely immutable. But uh, in the Git, one person can actually, using the force commit, can destroy the history of uh, the project completely with one shot. But uh, since we have things like GitHub, so Git became very popular. And uh, most of the people, most of the engineers are using, using Git. Uh, so sure, there are many other different reasons. So when why this selection were made or another one but uh, this is just an example of uh, how uh, the decisions are made and uh, so uh, we actually reduced uh, amount of uh, uh, systems and tools we're using professional control yes we have uh, two or three of them right now which are actually popular uh, many people don't even know that there was about maybe 20 systems which provides version control capabilities which were used in industry in different periods of times. But right now, since we significantly reduce uh, uh, this list to just two or three items, this allows us to have uh, you know a lot of uh, different bots, integrations, tools which are working with these repositories, which do the automation of these uh, repositories, automation of the processes which you need for uh, software development area, just because uh, people don't need to, you know, create their solution and port it for this or that uh, version control system. So they can focus on their functionality. And uh, so we are reducing diversity of uh, repositories which we are using that, uh, and we get uh, uh, the very diverse layer of integrations of these repositories in different tools and systems and so on. So this is how the hierarchical compensation law uh, by CEDOF is working. And uh, we are ready to move forward to the next uh, chapter of uh, our presentation, which is actually the main part of this presentation I want to talk about today. So this part was kind of uh, an introduction to give you brief understanding of uh, what's uh, what's the world of complex systems about and how it's uh, treated and interpreted by different people. And I tried to share uh, some, maybe not, uh, as I see it, uh, when I was preparing this presentation, not very well known uh, facts and uh, aspects of them uh, for, for for large audience. So uh, now we will look at uh, why the complex system, how they are failing. So the failures are very important when we're talking about uh, the complex systems, and uh, because. As we can see, and as, as we will see in, in, the, in the future slides, uh, the complex systems and the failures, it's something what exists always and it's working always side by side. Uh, here we will try to look at the world from uh, Dr. Cook, Dr. Richard Cook, who is actually uh, uh, the doctor of medicine. And uh, he uh, have a lot of works related to the systems, to the complexity. Uh, he did a lot uh, in area of the computer modeling and he was uh, uh, 
his most cited publication is related to the system dynamics and it's uh, it's, uh, it's titled like uh, going solid a model of system dynamics and consequences for patient safety and so uh, right now when we will talk about the complex system we will not focus on the systems like only technical systems we will just try to look at different kinds of systems and we will see the similarities in area of of uh, how they are failing actually so how they are uh, addressing failures how they deal with the failures so and uh, uh dr cook introduced uh if i'm not mistaken 15 uh different uh, aspects and uh, different uh, uh let's say takeouts about uh system failures and behavior of complex systems and we will try to go through them and uh, I'll try to state this uh, the, each point and give some comments about how I understand this or uh, how I know that uh, it's understood by, by my colleagues. So uh, here is uh, the, the first point uh, which is stated as a complex systems are intrinsically hazardous system. So all of the interesting, interesting systems are uh, inherently and unavoidably hazardous by their own nature. The frequency of the hazard exposure can sometimes be changed, but the process involved in the systems are themselves intrinsically and irreducibly hazardous. And it's the presence of the hazard that drives the creation of the defense against the hazard that characterizes the systems. So when we're talking about the complex systems, uh, we need to understand that the failure is always somewhere around and uh, when the system is really large and, uh, and, and complex, it's always uh, about to be hazardous. So the, actually the understanding of the hospital may be different in different uh, areas. For example, if we are building information security, information system, we can see that uh, the hazardous area, for example, is pretty because this is where we can fail. So, for example, data which we are putting in the system can be stolen. And so uh, this is a very hot topic right now. We can see that uh, how many, uh, how often in the news we see about news about uh, different cybersecurity aspects and so on. But uh, also we can see that uh, it's always about the data losses. So if our system is operate some data, we can always uh, lose data because of uh, uh, I don't know, hardware failures, software bugs, uh, human factor, and so on and so on. So that is why uh, when we are uh, dealing with any kind of a system, we're paying the giant attention to uh, this actually thing. So this hazardous uh, aspects we frequently call risks actually. So, and when we are working with the complex systems, dealing with the risks is actually one of the major uh, things which we are actually doing because when we are dealing with uh, when we're developing the system so maybe at least half of the efforts we're spending on building the defenses defenses from from actually these risks and uh, hazard aspects of its behavior uh, so we are not right now talking about for example the complex systems which are working in the factories and so on because they are uh, the meaning of hazardous system is actually completely different because uh, these systems can bring harm to the real people. But on the other side, uh, we can uh, find some examples when uh, systems which we are uh, developing can be hazardous even in a way that we can't predict it. For example, there was uh, an interesting case. Uh, it was maybe a year or two ago. There was a really popular application uh, for uh, sport tracking. So this application allows you to track uh, your daily runs, your uh, morning, evening cycling, and so on, so swimming, and so on, and so on. So, and it's appeared that this uh, application appeared pretty hazardous for those who are using it. So you can think, so how the sport tracking application can be hazardous, but uh, it was because uh, the user experience in uh, the bicycle mode was not very good and uh, sometimes for some operations it uh, requires some pretty focused attention because uh, of, of uh, the user uh, because uh, you know some controls were too small or it was uh, really hard to use them when you're actually driving your bicycle 
and uh, the consequences of this was that uh, the people periodically falls off the bicycles when they were trying to switch uh, the mode or to use uh, to pose it before you know standing at the traffic light and so on. And uh, actually, you when, when you're developing your applications, you're not frequently thinking about that. Okay, so what people will do when they will use my application? So that's why you're just okay. So I'll put this button here, make it of this size. So uh, later they changed the user experience they made uh, for this particular case, which was actually uh, uh, which identified as a, as a dangerous for the user. So the user experience was changed in this part of the application. And uh, the amount of people who are actually falls off their bicycles reduced significantly. So that is why uh, what, this is what it means that uh, the complex system is hard than this. So, uh, and we always need to keep in mind uh, when we are making our system that we not often can predict all the ways in which our system can actually damage our users and uh, those who will actually uh, use it. So uh, let's move forward. And the next statement is the complex systems are heavily and successfully defined against the failures. So the high consequences of failures lead over time to the uh, construction of multiple layers of a defense against the failure. These defenses include obvious technical components and human components, but also a variety of organizational, institutional, regulatory defenses uh, the effect of these measures is to provide a series of shields that normally divert operations away from accidents. Uh, we almost, it, we, we can't build, uh, you know, the systems which will be completely bulletproof, uh, failure protected. Uh, just because one thing, all of our systems are dealing with users. So there will be uh, a bunch of points uh, regarding the users. So I, I don't want actually to touch them right now. But uh, as I already say, when we are uh, building the system, so maybe half of our efforts goes to protecting, first of all, uh, the users from our system. And uh, we also need to protect our system from a variety of different things which uh, can happen to it. So the most simple and most obvious case is, the, for example, the misuse of the system which we are trying to deliver. So uh, and so here we are, for example, everybody who is doing the software development knows that, for example, if you're interacting with the user, you're trying as much as possible to defend your system from, for example, wrong inputs, because for all input fields, you are providing, you know, checkers which provide so the format of the inputs. For example, if uh, we have a field so for example, when you were signing up to this meeting, you was filling up the sign up form and there was email field. So, and also if this email field is verified to be sure that this is a really email. So we are verifying that this field is not empty. So there is some regular expression which shows that's okay. So something what user type this really looks like uh, email address. Sure, we are unable to provide to verify that uh, this email address is a real email address. So that's why we're sending the link to this meeting uh, to provide the email address to ensure that this is the real person registered to this meeting. It's not, for example, like some bot, which uh, just due to some reason expl exploring the web and trying to get some information for uh, their owners and so on. So uh, actually, when even when we're doing as not very complicated system, yeah, but uh, even even simple system like you know the sign up form, we already need to build uh, the number of uh, defense layers uh, when which help us the, to protect the system and uh, make it usable for for the majority of uh, for the majority of uh, users. And also we are uh, doing a lot of things which are. In most cases, we, for example, can think that uh, some kind of uh, uh, 
too much for for this particular uh, particular case for example for those who are working in the, in large companies you know that large companies like to provide trainings to their uh, employees on many different areas and so on and so pretty frequently we're thinking when we're passing these trainings we can think okay so it's it's very simple thing so how someone cannot understand them but this is really what's happened in the real life so even very simple things can be actually uh, understood in the wrong way. So they can be misused, not because uh, people just want to break something. No, but because uh, it's really hard to predict, uh, let's say, ambiguity of some explanations of some signs and so on. So actually, when we are thinking about, so, you know, a small group of people and we're providing trainings to them saying that, so here's how to use something and so on so and they will say it's very easy and uh, why should we actually they care about it so it's it's obvious but what's obvious to one people may be completely not obvious to someone else so that is why we have all this organizational we have institutional and uh, measures applied to, to, to the particular system and so actually this is one of uh, the root causes why for example we're uh, bringing some limitations on uh, what operations can be done by uh, what kind of people. So that's why we have a special roles. That's why we, for example, in, in many companies, when you're working at the office, for example, you are not allowed to do, you know, some, for example, if uh, the power socket is broken, uh, obviously some people can fix them, but not everybody. So that is why we have a special technicians uh, who actually train to fix, for example, electrical sockets on do this you know electrical related work or works related to for example you know water supplies and so on and so on so some of engineers on the company can do this but not everyone and so uh, that is why in general it's uh, pretty frequently restricted to do so so if you see that uh, there is some failure in the office because our office is also a complex system which uh, which can be addressed with uh, with a whole uh, bunch of instruments and uh, tools for uh, uh, targeted for the complex system. So, and if we see that something in, is broken in the office, uh, in, in, in many companies, it's simply prohibited for, uh, for regular employees to fix it. So the only thing which I can actually do is to report an incident. And then the special person will come here and uh, solve this in, in a proper way because uh, this person is trained. So this is also, you know, combination of institutional and uh, and human components because we have uh, a special group of people who do this work, a uh, group of people trained in a special way, and this is applicable to all systems which we have. Because, for example, if we are talking about uh, uh, our modern software in industry, we have engineers who do the development, we have people who are doing uh, DevOps development operations, so these people who are tuning our clusters, who are working about the security, the people who are doing the performance and load testing and so on. Uh, pretty frequently, we have very experienced engineers who have a good knowledge of, for example, the Kubernetes, they have a good knowledge about the performance testing and so on. So they potentially can do this, but we are putting all the, uh, well, we are putting all this uh, knowledge in, 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 in the small group of people who are doing everything, uh, we will not achieve the same high results, uh, which we can do when we have a distributed uh, load and distributed, uh, and distributed uh, responsibilities, let's say. So that's why how we are for the complex system, we build uh, the chain or we build the layers of uh, defenses against different kinds of failures. Yes, we can uh, hardware failures, software failures, I don't know, water supply failures. And uh, so we are putting this layer by layer. And that is why we can say that actually our systems are in most cases pretty well protected from uh, this kind of uh, failures. But uh, yeah, so uh, we are, th th this is the way how we address them. The next uh, point I want to move forward is that uh, the catastrophe requires multiple failures. Single fault of failure are not enough. 
the array of the fences works. So we have a lot of things which we had just discussed and so all these items are actually in place and they're protecting us pretty well. But, uh, and system operates in general are successful. Over catastrophic failures occurred when small, apparently inaccurious failure joined to increase opportunity for a systematic accident. Uh, so let's, uh, let's work in the following way. So in, in general, uh, let's again take an example from, uh, for example, uh, the software engineering. Yes, uh, when we have a cloud solution, we have a cloud service, whatever vendor is provided, and we will take a look at the logs of this solution. We will see that exceptions are happening pretty frequently. So here or there, we, there were some issues and uh, here and there something, you know, some, mix and match uh, different things. And so, uh, for example, some misunderstanding between components happening. So some data get lost maybe somewhere and so on. So there are a lot of things happening constantly there. So for example, if you are using some popular services, maybe sometimes you can see that the browser say some kind of error in the web UI, which you're using the service, then you're you know refreshing the page and it works again. So this is how, uh, this happens in, a, in, in, in a, when you're dealing with a complex system. In most cases, they are too complex to be failureless. There are always small failures inside, and there are always a lot of these failures. And uh, in, in many cases, uh, the system in general, even there are some failures, internal failures in it, system works properly. So we can see that, uh, for example, we are introducing a lot of, when we step back on a previous point about uh, how we are targeting the layers of the defense, uh, we can say that we know that we have uh, timeouts to wait for some operations to complete. We have uh, different retries when some operation fails, we are adding the retries and finally it will succeed. So it means that uh, to lead to the really catastrophic failure, we need not only one failure in one place, we need uh, some kind of a unique combination of a failures, which leads actually uh, to the to the real catastrophe, so which actually the breaks the system. Because we can see that, for example, let's say we have a system which is processing the large amount of messages. Let's say we're doing the IoT. And in this IoT, we are processing maybe 10,000 messages per second. And so sometimes we still know we have exceptions, maybe some of single messages uh, got lost or they processed several times because of processing failures. And so we do the retries and so on. But uh, the system will stay, life and so on so and maybe we have some you know database lags or jitters when we're processing messages but in general it's still working and to make the system really fail so to bring it completely down we need to have a bunch of combinations uh, of different failures which will actually lead to, to the crash so a real world example i was working i uh, was controlling some company which was doing the iot solution and uh Sometimes they uh, have uh, the thing that, uh, you know, the whole system was going down and uh, they were questioning. So, so uh, okay, we have a retry logic. So we have uh, this, uh, so there was issues with uh, connectivity to some data sources. And uh, the problem was that uh, Actually, the problem with each particular data source was pretty well covered and with uh, things like retry logic, timeouts and so on. So it was, it was reliable. So the communication was poor, but uh, it, was, it was working in general. A system, it was working reliably. But sometimes system was uh, going completely down. And uh, the question was why? And it appeared that uh, some operations which were in this system require uh, dealing with the multiple data sources. And uh, if two of them were not responsible together in, a, in the same uh, time frame, this leads to uh, the real failure of the system because uh, the operations in the queue, the queue with the operations was uh, overflow. And uh, actually this breaks uh, the system completely because of uh, this uh, overflow of this queue. So here we can see that uh, the failure of each particular data source was actually was fine. So the system was able to work with them. So these uh, failures were um, 
cover it and uh, they were working pretty well. But when there was a combination of these failures for these two particular data sources, among maybe they have maybe something like 15, I think. So among these 15, only combination of failures in simultaneously in two of them actually crashed the system. So uh, that is why, uh, so th th this is an example of how to, we can see that only the multiple failures actually lead to, to a complete crash of this, of the application. Uh, so uh, moving uh, forward, so it's actually the continuation of what I was talking about. The complex system contains a changing mixture of failures latent within them. So uh, when we have a system and uh, we will discuss this, I think in, in, in details on the previous slide, uh, we always have the set of failures which are going inside. So maybe some components became unresponsible. Maybe we have a connectivity issues between uh, some components and and so on and so on. So and our systems are should be designed in a fault tolerant way. So to be sure that uh, when something nasty happening inside, uh, our system can actually live with it. It can continue operates and can, uh, for example, isolate the part which is, so let's say, unstable right now, but it will get back. So uh, that's why, for example, when we have uh, clusters which are serving requests, we have a special systems which are constantly polling this cluster and say, so how nodes are you doing? So are you, are you feeling well? Uh, okay, so this node says it's not doing well. So let's uh, not wrote new requests to this node. We will suddenly restart it. So when it restarts, it gets green again. So we can also start putting the, uh, the load on it and so on and so on. So, uh, the, 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 that is why when we're designing and working with a complex system, we need to uh, always understand that, uh, so we always have some combination of the failures. We also have some, we always have some issues and more complex system we have, the more different issues inside of it uh, we, we will have. And our problem is that we need to make a system which in, in which we will not have a combination of issues which will actually break the system. So getting back to the example of uh, uh, which, which I mentioned before when actually uh, two data sources, so when they go down simultaneously can lead to the system crash. So uh, it, it, it was just rapid as a combination, as an issue of combination of these two issues. So there were special measures taken in a case that if these two data sources are actually uh, not available right now, so the requests for, for them were just treated in a special way, not to overflow the, the whole pipeline of the requests processing. Uh, so yeah, uh, in this system we had uh, there, there was uh, actually always a combination of some something not working, but the system was tolerant to this and was working it. And this leads us to the next slide, which say that the complex thing, systems are running in a degraded mode. So uh, as per uh, Dr. Cook, it's uh, a corollary to the preceding point is that complex systems run as a broken system. The system continues to function because it contains so many redundancies and because people can make it functioning despite the presence of many flows. After accident reviews, nearly always note that the system has a history of prior proto accidents that nearly generates the catastrophe. Arguments that these degraded conditions should have been recognized before over the accident are usually predicted on a naive notion of a system performance. System operations are dynamic with the components failing and being replaced continuously. So, uh, you know, when you are just starting learning the programming on the languages, like for example, C Sharp, Java, maybe Python, actually most of the high level languages, and so uh, you're starting to uh, do some things and you're facing the exceptions, you used to think that exception, it's a something very, very, very bad. So you need to avoid them. So your application should never send exceptions and so on. Later, when you're growing your maturity, you understand that so exceptions is a, is a normal flow of an application to tell the world that it don't like something. So that something is so wrong and so on. So when we're looking at a high scale system, the big complex systems, we need to understand that the failures 
it's not something what actually uh, it's what breaks everything and we need to do everything to avoid failures and so on. Uh, actually, no, so the failures is part of the system. So this is something what actually live inside it. So we need to uh, build a system which can uh, actually live with a certain amount of failures and in the same time be responsive. So do the thing which are expected from it, you know, uh, implement the majority of the functionality, sort of majority of the requests, do the majority of the job. Uh, I'm not saying that we need to ignore the failures. So we need to address them, but it, when we have a failures inside the system, it doesn't matter that uh, it's, it's a bad system and it's not working and so on. So uh, having experience with different cloud solutions, I would say that uh, there are constantly a lot of failures happening inside. So even, even as a user, for example, even using the very popular uh, tools of in my daily life, pretty frequently we can, I, I see some, for example, some files are not getting synchronized or I see some forms showing the errors and the system still works. So as a developers and engineers uh, for the system, I'm pretty sure that this, uh, uh, their vendors are you know, carefully monitoring this, they collect information about happening exceptions in the system. So they introducing the patches, which for example, closing uh, one hole and so, you know, reducing the amount of failures which are happening and so on. But most probably uh, the fixes, you know, introducing new issues, which will appear maybe not today or tomorrow, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll see that, okay, so we fix this box, but some other box shows up. And we need to understand, we need to treat the complex system as, you know, some kind of a living object. So it's constantly mutating. And uh, yes, we are fixing some issues, we are reducing some failures, some other failures are happening, not because we break something, but because uh, our users introduce new way how to use our product. Because you actually can't predict all the ways how uh, the, your end users will actually use your system. So that is why, yes, you need to do the monitoring, you need to do uh, the good job about, uh, you know, uh, finding new ways how your system failing, your need to find a way how to fix it for the future. But uh, in general, you don't need to uh, put the goal to build a completely uh, failureless application or failureless system because it's actually not achievable goal. So you need to build an application which will have a good SLA, so service availability. Uh, of your application should be of your system should be high. And it doesn't matter that when you have a high availability of your system, there are no failures inside. So, uh, and so uh, you need to understand that uh, your system, complicated system is almost always in degraded mode, even if you don't see this, even if you don't feel this, and even if you don't have uh, evidences that right now there are failures. Most probably in the complicated systems they are, they just have been, haven't been observed, haven't been found and so on. Uh, and so actually the consequence of this is the catastrophe is always just around the corner. So we already talked about that uh, uh, the catastrophe is a combination of some uh, random failures which are happening in the system. And we now know that there is always a random combination of uh, the failures inside of any complex system. So that is why the catastrophe is always around the corner. So the complex system possesses potential for catastrophic failures. Human practitioners are nearly always in close physical and temporal proximity for the potential failures. Disaster can occur anytime and nearly at any place. The potential for catastrophic outcome is a hallmark of complex systems. It is it is impossible to eliminate the potential of such catastrophic failure. The potential of such failure is always present by the system's own nature. So uh, like we are lucky if we are talking about the software systems. Yeah, right now I was uh, trying to synchronize some files with, with OneDrive because I'm using the OneDrive. And uh, it was working fine. So the files were going back and forth between me and the server and then synchronization just stopped working. So I was not able to synchronize anything for about maybe 10, 15 minutes. So, okay, so something catastrophic happens for my particular cases. Doesn't mean that there is uh, 
you know the catastrophe uh, happens on on the side of the vendor but uh, for for me it was uh, kind of a catastrophic failure because uh, I was in a rush. I will need to. I was going to provide to share some uh, files with uh, with some of my colleagues, and so I was not able to do this just uh, because uh, synchronization just failed for me. And so, did I expect it? No. Did I observe any other issues with the behavior? No. This this just happened. And actually, it's a good if it's just happening like uh, uh, synchronization of uh, of uh, the. Uh, of the file. So if it's sure, if, if I don't have a, you know, kind of presentation in 10 minutes and need to share my slides, which I will be presenting in, in 10 or five minutes. So that's why, uh, for example, uh, right now we are having this call in a Zoom. And so potentially, since I'm you know, dealing a lot with different systems, especially cloud systems and so on, I know that potentially everything may happen. And for example, uh, the Zoom can just go down right now. and so, my presentation will be interrupted. Or uh, I have experience with uh, uh, with the recordings when uh, it's appeared that uh, Zoom was reporting that it's recording my meeting, but due to some reason, it's recorded only the half of it. So when I was converting the video, it in the middle it say that it can't convert uh, the rest of the parts. So here is just what what you have, and I was uh, having just half of my meeting. So it means that. Uh, in, in, in most cases, the majority of cases, I'm, when I need to do the recording of the meeting, I just just record it in the Zoom because, okay, I can rely on it. In most cases, there is no problem. I have only one uh, failure of this kind. So maybe may something gone wrong here. So when I have really important things, I actually do the double recording because I am also do the recording of my desktop. And uh, so actually I will have uh, two kinds of recordings. So. Uh, the Zoom one is a little bit better because it will embed uh, my video into this uh, presentation. So uh, for the uh, uh, other uh, uh, recording which I have, it will be just without my video. But right now, for example, yeah, I, I'm making two recordings uh, at, at the same time. Uh, so that, that's where we need to actually understand that uh, the catastrophe is always just around. And actually, that is why I am a bad tester, for example. So when I'm working on a project, <clears throat> uh, I'm really, when I'm using the project, I'm always uh, trying to be very careful at how I'm using it, especially when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm developing it. So yes, I'm trying to very carefully test what I'm working on right now, but the rest of the project, uh, the rest of parts, I'm, you know, uh, doing all the things very carefully, so trying to uh, use the good data putting in just to, you know, because I know that I don't want to break right now my test in some other place uh, not related to what I'm doing. Uh, because I know that, you know, that when you're dealing with the system, the catastrophe is always just around the corner. Uh, and so let's say the catastrophe already happens and uh, we need to actually do some kind of homework to figure out why it's happened. And so here we come num number seven. So the post accident attribution accident to a root cause is fundamentally wrong. So because overt failure requires multiple faults, there is no isolated cause of an accident. There are multiple contributors to an accident. Each of this is necessary insufficient in itself to create an accident. Only jointly are these causes sufficient to create an accident. Indeed, it's in the linking of this cause together that creates the circumstances required for the accident. Thus, no isolation of the root cause of an accident is possible. The evaluations based on such reasoning as root cause do not reflect a technical understanding of the nature of failure, but rather the social, cultural need to blame specific localized force or event of outcome. Uh, so this, I think that, you know, when. Uh, when we are you know, following the flow of this presentation, we know that uh, there are always failures in, in, in a system. And uh, there are always a combination of the failures and only some of them actually leads to a catastrophic failure, which is actually always around the corner. But if the catastrophe happens, it is very hard to figure out why uh, it happened. In most cases, yes, we can say, okay, so here is the root cause. And when we are saying that, when we're figuring out uh, that when, when we're naming 
some root cause as a root cause of uh, the whole failure, it means that we are dropping down the rest of the conditions, which actually potentially may also be uh, the part of this uh, of this uh, failure party. And uh, it's not uh, it's not efficient to actually try to figure out this single root cause and put all the efforts in you know solving it. If we found that okay, so here here is a uh, here are the failure. We always need to understand that there is another for, first of all chain of events which lead to this failure. Also, there is always a group of uh, contributors to this failure, which uh, actually may be not obvious for us, but uh, if we actually will try to trigger only one aspect of the failure which we see, this will also, uh, it means that we will just not do anything with the rest of the guys. And in the future, this company can come back again with some new friend uh, as a replacement of the one which we will actually uh, nail and will bring us a new failure. So that is why we need to, when we do the reverse engineering of the, the problem, we need to think wider than uh, trying to find and uh, only one aspect and blame it in, in all possible uh, in all possible problems. So uh, the highest bias post accident assessment of the human performance. Knowledge of the outcome makes it seem that event leading to the outcome should have appeared more than silent to practitioner at the, at the time than was actually the case. This means that ex post facto accident analysis of human performance is inaccurate. The outcome knowledge uh, poison the ability of after accident observations to recreate the view of the partitioner before the accident uh, for those same factors. It seems that partitioner should have known that the factors would inevitably lead to an accident. Uh, so this is actually about uh, pretty much the same what we also already discussed on the, on the, on the previous slide. So when we're trying to evaluate operations of, uh, for example, the human who operates the system at, at a point of failure, we are trying to figure out uh, why the, so what, which his particular actions leads to, uh, to, to, to the failure. And pretty often we are uh, trying to build our uh, mind flow in a way that it's actually the partitioner should, should have known that issue will happen. But uh, since we are uh, dealing with, for example, in most cases with the regular operations, you know, that operations which uh, system uh, is doing, you know, many, many, many times, or uh, when we are, when we are talking about, for example, uh, about, you know, the routine operations which are done by operator on, on some systems, yeah? Uh, we can say, okay, so here, here is uh, uh, the number of steps which operator does and uh, which operator did and this lead to the failure. In, in many cases, it will not be correct because for example, uh, let's take uh, my case with uh, synchronizing files on the OneDrive. Uh, this is a set of operations I'm always doing. So I'm just copying the files, I'm waiting for them to be synchronized. In all, all the cases it was working. And now when I did exactly the same, so something gone wrong. Can we try to think about that uh, maybe I put uh, uh, the wrong file, maybe file was of the wrong size, or maybe I just, when I was doing the drag and drop, I do that, I did the drop in the wrong place of, of the web page. So that's why it was uh, not successfully uploaded. Uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the root cause. The root cause is that each time when I'm dealing with the system, I'm dealing with the system in its unique state. And it means that the operation which I used to do in this way, and it was always working for me, uh, may not work this time. So it doesn't mean that uh, my particular actions lead to the problem. It means that combination of my particular actions, which I always do in the same way, for example, and the current state of the system, uh, leads to the problem. So it's more complex thing than uh, just understanding what actually the user did with the system. It's more about uh, the whole part of uh, how it was integrated and uh, done together. <clears throat> so uh, let's move forward. 
The human operators have a dual role as a producer and a defender against the failure. The system practitioner operates the system in order to produce its desired product and also work to forestall accident. This dynamic quality of the system operation, the balancing of demands and the production against the possibility of incipient failure is unavoidable. Outsiders rarely acknowledge the doability of this role. In non-accident field times, the production role is emphasized. After accident, the defense against the failure role is emphasized. At either time, the outsider's view miss misappends uh, the operator's constant, simultaneous engagement with both roles. So uh, this actually, uh, for me, it looks some, like something obvious, right? So when we are just operating the system, so everything works fine, we're completely uh, focused on, on what we are doing. So how, the, how we are trying to work with the system, how we are trying to be high performance, how to solve our own issues. When we're starting to see issues with the system, we're starting to pay more attention to use it carefully, not to damage our work, not to damage ourselves, not to actually damage the system, because we know that the system is important for us. So we need to, to have it for, for our operations. So that's, let's be careful with it. So maybe we need to uh, be careful about our inputs. Maybe we need to uh, be careful with uh, with system processing something. Maybe we don't need, if uh, we see the thing, system thinking about our request, maybe we don't need to press 10 times reload button and say, okay, so please, uh, come on, come on, come on, why are you not processing my request? So we also need to think about how can we defend the system from, from the failure as, a, as a users who are uh, actually dealing with it and who are working with it. <clears throat> So uh, all practitioners are the gamblers. After accident, uh, the overt failure often appears to have been inevitable and the practitioner actions as uh, blunders or deliberate willful disregard of a certain impeding the failure. But all practitioner actions are actually gambles. That is uh, acts that uh, take place in the face of uncertain outcomes. The degree of instantaneity may change from moment to moment. The practitioner actions are gambles, appears clear after accident. In general, post hoc analysis regards these gambles as poor ones, uh, but the converse that successful outcomes are also the result of gambles is not widely appreciated. Uh, if we are, <clears throat> uh, so, we, I understand this in the following way. So when we're dealing with the system and we are trying to use the system, it's like, uh, you know, mm, uh, using the, you know, the, uh, flipping up the coin. So it can fall one side and the operation will succeed. It can fall another side and uh, it, it will fail. And uh, in, in most cases, uh, people and users and uh, developers trying to think that, uh, only uh, failures of the system have a probabilistic model. But uh, since every outcome of the system is an outcome, uh, so both ways, it's, uh, we have a probability of success, we have a probability of failure. So it doesn't mean that we are always succeeding, but sometimes we are failing. No, with, we just have a chance that uh, with this, variety, this uh, probability we will succeed and this probability we will fail. In, for good systems, the probability of success should be much higher than the failure. But uh, we shouldn't expect that uh, the nature of success and the failure when you're interacting with a complex system is different. No, it's the nature of it, it's exactly the same. So we either getting the success or we are getting the failure. But uh, it's not like, you know, coin with the two sides and 50-50 uh, chances. It's uh, should be the coin with the huge amount of sides, the most of them are success. Because actually, you know, understanding the success is also uh, for some systems, it's also not, uh, uh, the notion of the success for different users can, uh, or different participants to the system can be uh, the same. For example, uh, we can, I don't know, let's take as an example, uh, the application when you are trying to uh, get a taxi. So, for you, success means that uh, you can successfully create an order. 
for uh, for the taxi driver, the success means that uh, he can receive an order, accept it, you know, get the road details, and actually pick the passenger and so on. Uh, in 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 a wider view, uh, the success of the taxi driver is a part of the success for the customer, for the consumer, because uh, if you're creating a taxi request, you actually need a driver, you need a car, and you actually need to get from uh, point A to point B. So, but uh, there are also a lot of uh, other participants in this system which you are completely not aware of. For example, you have, uh, uh, let's say, DevOps people who are collecting the monitoring of the system, who collect the metrics. And so, uh, even if your ride was successful, but sometimes, some, somewhere internally, uh, the system was broken and it haven't reported the metrics about uh, your drive. Uh, you don't care about this. So DevOps guys will be sad because they didn't get the metrics about this right. They will not be able to, you know, analyze data or maybe analytical department will not get information about uh, the route and uh, the traffic jams on the route and they will not be able to optimize uh, the routes for the uh, for the future right. But uh, you actually don't know anything about this. So you know that, okay, so you successfully moved from point A to point B. So for you, your case, uh, this multi-sided coins, um, uh, get with you know the wrong uh, with the right side, so you succeeded, you you traveled, uh, but for other folks it may be it may be different, and uh, so and such use cases uh, there will be many many such use cases, so the actions at the sharp end resolve all ambiguity, organizations are ambiguous often into intentionally about the relationship between uh, production targets, efficient uh, use of resources, economy and costs of operation, and acceptable risk of low and high consequences accidents. All ambiguity is resolved by actions of a partitioner at the sharp end of the system. After the accident partitioner action may be regarded as an error or violations, but these evaluations are heavily based by inciting and ignore the other uh, driving forces, especially uh, production pressure. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's actually hard to add anything here as, as, as a case because it looks pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So, uh, uh, so uh, the human partitioners are the adaptable element of the complex system. And uh, so partitioners at the first line management actually adapt uh, the system to maximize the production and minimize accidents. Uh, the adaptions often occurs on a moment by moment basis. Uh, some of these adaptions includes uh, restructuring the system in order to reduce exposure of vulnerable parts, uh, concentrating critical resources in area of expected high demand, providing pathways for retreating or recovery from expected and unexpected faults, establishing means for early detection of changes system performance in order to allow graceful uh, cutbacks in production or other means of increasing res resiliency. So uh, actually when we are using the complex system, we're always uh, adapting them for our needs. And in most cases, the partitioners like users of the system is the adaptable element of the complex system. So we are more adapting to the system. We are adapting our, so uh, let, let, let's take it this way. Uh, when we are introducing a completely new system in some new area, uh, we are, uh, first of all, designing the system. We're designing the system for this area. And we have some vision of, uh, of our target space where we're going to put uh, our, our solution. So that's why we're designing the solution according to our vision. Then we're putting the solution in place and people in this area starting using it. But their vision may be different from what we had. So that is why we are actually starting, we are adapting to the system because uh, when system is in place, yes, we can uh, file a tickets, we can uh, send a request to do the improvements and to adapt the system better to real conditions. But in all cases, we're trying to adapt uh, to the system and adapt uh, the use cases our, around this uh, system. So, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> so, uh, 
So yeah, and so uh, <coughs> and also when we operating the system, like uh, providers of the system, we see how this system is used, and we can do one of the following things, which we have on the slide. For example, is if we see that uh, you know some combination of actions are vulnerable or uh, can lead to the failure and so on. So for example, if two operations made together in the system can lead to a failure. So maybe we will just put them in a different part of our uh, user interface. So user will not be able to try to do two operations of this kind uh, <coughs> uh, simultaneously. And uh, so we are, we are trying to adapt the system itself for the use cases. Uh, also, you know, the putting resources here and there, uh, optimizing their locations and so on. So this is, for example, very widely used in area of uh, cloud services development. Just for, for example, in our lab, we're developing the cloud solutions and cloud services. So we are constantly balancing, we are monitoring how the people are using the solutions, which uh, we are uh, releasing like SD Cloud or SD Lytica platforms. And we are trying to reshape how they are deployed in our data centers. Because for example, we have set of data centers in different uh, locations uh, in the world. So in, in States and Europe and Russia. So based on the use cases, which we currently have and the load, we are trying to re rebalance uh, our, our shape of our equipment uh, and so on and so on. So this this would mean the adoption of the system and adoption for the system. So uh, human experience is a complex in complex system is constantly changing. So the complex systems require substantial human expertise in their operations and management. And this expertise changed in characters as the technology changes, but it also changed because of the need to replace expert wholly. In every case, training and refinement of skills and expertise is one of part of the function of the system itself. At any moment, therefore, a given complex system will contain practitioners and trainees with a varying degree of experience. Critical issue related to expertise areas form are the need to use uh, scare expertise as a resources for the most difficult or demanding production needs and uh, the need to develop expertise for the future. <coughs> uh, so th 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 that's actually also uh, where, where, very true for, for all possible cases where we use uh, the complex systems. So when I'm saying the complex systems, I mean uh, all kinds of system, not only technical, for example, organizational systems. Let's say we have a software development process according to which we are delivering our software. And uh, we always have people who are uh, coming to our company. We always have people who just joined. We have people who are working for a long time. We are uh, having people who are about to leave the company uh, due to some reasons. And uh, that, that, that is why the expertise of this, the whole group is very diverse. So some of them who are working for a long time, they you know they know the evolution of this process. They know why, for example, these or that decisions were made. So that's why they respect our process and uh, they always working according to it. So there are people who are just joined the team and we have provided trainings for them and explaining. So here is our processes, here how they work, and uh, so. <clears throat> They learning this and uh, sure they will do some mistakes uh, when they will do their uh, daily operations because uh, when we do the explanation of the protesters, we can't avoid ambiguity. So maybe they will understand what, what, what we are saying, but they understand it not exactly as we expect they will understand. And uh, also there are, you know, people who are just violating some constraints just because they think it will be better for for the process and potentially can be it. So sometimes people can say that, so they coming from another company and they saw some other, uh, for example, process elements and they say, so we can change the process because if we will do this instead of that, it will be more efficient because you know it was efficient with the previous technology stack, but with the new technology stack, it's we need to all adapt and uh, we, we need to do the change. <coughs> so uh, th 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 that's why we, always need to maintain kind of uh, the common vision of the system, the common vision of the expertise which we have in it. Uh, actually the same completely applicable for the complex systems. Let's say, for example, if we have a production line, which uh, 
complicated production line, which, for example, assembles some complicated products. Uh, there are a lot of operations that needs to be done. A majority of them are automated, uh, but uh, there are still a lot of operations which are done by the humans. And actually, the thing about automated operations is that uh, when we're saying that, uh, okay, so we have automated operations, that means that we don't need humans anymore. No, it's, it's completely wrong perception because when we have automated production lines, it means that we need more qualified uh, people who will not actually do the job, but who will actually be able to uh, manage, control, and monitor the work of the machines which are actually doing the job. And this kind of, you know, higher level of complexity, because the, these people have to understand not only how the job should be done, they should very well understand how these machines are working. So they will be able to fine tune them, so to keep the whole production line in the most performance state and so on and so on. So that's, uh, and this also is about expertise, which we have on the system, because if we have, you know, five people and uh, someone new joins the team, uh, we need to make sure that his vision of how we fine tuning our, our system is shared with him. Or for example, if uh, some experienced uh, person who have very good experience in this system, uh, decided to leave the team that uh, he will not leave for example with some critical knowledge that uh, uh, this knowledge will be transferred to the rest of the team and we will be able to still operate as successful as we did uh, before uh, actually he is uh, uh, before he is uh, his, his leave. Uh, so changes introduced new forms of failures the low rate of uh, overt accident is reliably reliable system may encourage changes, especially uh, the use of new technology to decrease the number of uh, flow consequence, but high frequency failures. These changes may be actually create opportunities for new low frequency, but higher consequence failures. When new technologies are used to eliminate well understood system failures or gain high precision performance, they often introduce new pathways to large scale catastrophic failures. So uh, yeah, this I think was pretty explanatory and uh, this was also what uh, I was already tried to mention before that when we are uh, fixing failure points, when we are, uh, when we actually doing, uh, when we actually doing the, uh, uh, let, let's say doing the bug fix of some systems, uh, we are always replacing known with unknown because potentially, for example, if you have, uh, if you're improving the, especially the performance of the system, if you're improving the performance of some part of it, uh, uh, you have a system which was working pretty well, but you found that, okay, so these pieces have low performance, I want to improve them. You're improving them and this became, this part became uh, better in a performance way, but it may appear that in some long run, they will flood some other components which were not fine-tuned and aligned with them. And that is why uh, actually we will not make our system better, we will break it. So when we do any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, changes, we need to understand that we are replacing known issues with some unknown issues. And this is always the risk which we need to uh, properly uh, understand and properly uh, address. So one of the last uh, points is that view of a cause limits the effectiveness of the defense against the failures. This is pretty much what we already discussed when we were talking about uh, the root causes of the failures and root cause analysis, because when we're trying to name uh, the root cause of the failure, pretty frequently we are just losing the view of other contributors to this failure. And uh, maybe even if we will eliminate some guy which was obvious to us, it doesn't matter that we will not get uh, the same failure in the future because potentially the majority of uh, majority of responsibility for the failure is actually on other folks in the system who are uh, when you found the root cause, uh, they actually leave unattended and uh, they will bring the failures again. So uh, the next is the safety. Safety is a characteristic of the system and not their components. 
So this is very important to understand. It's like uh, the functionality of the system is not uh, means that this functionality of its components, the functionality of the systems is uh, the functionality of the component synergy. With the safety, everything is exactly the same. Because, for example, you can take the components which are completely safe, and you know they're bulletproof, robust, resilient, whatever. But when you're building a system out of it, it just blows up and brings a lot of damage uh, and uh, you know harm people, break data, and so on and so on. So this can be this is a very easy case. So that is why you when you are building the system, you can't say that this system is safe because it's built out of safe components. The system should be safe by design. Yes, the usage of, uh, of well-tuned and safe components is important. But when you're designing the system, you need to design it as a safe as a whole, not completely relying on the uh, uh, other components safe or not. <clears throat> uh, next is that that's, uh, people continuously create sale, so can create uh, safety. So we also already touched this in some other points that uh, when people interact uh, with the system, they also can uh, actually interact with it in a safe or not safe way. And uh, people should be responsible for the system when they're interacting with it. So if, uh, for example, the text field requires entering the email address, correct email address, it, it means that we need to put the email address there, not, not the phone number. So we don't need to uh, actually try to, <clears throat> you know, uh, break the system and say, okay, so I'll put the data as, as I just want and the system will figure out what to do with them. Because for example, if uh, the system was uh, designed and developed and not in the best way, it may not verify that uh, you put uh, the wrong, you put a phone number in the email field, but later it will crash internally, well, it will try to send you an email and it will receive uh, the phone number instead of email. And uh, you know the library, which is responsible for sending emails will just crash. Uh, just because you're putting the wrong data when you was filling up some form. <clears throat> uh, last but not least, the failure-free operations requires experience with the failures. And this is a very important aspect. And I think that this is uh, kind of the synergy of the whole presentation, so which I was trying to share. I was trying to uh, give uh, the audience understanding of the failure and give some directions of where this experience can be gathered and applied. So uh, when people know what failure means, and so when people know that if something fails, it doesn't mean, hopefully, in most cases, end of the world. So, uh, but when we interacting with the systems, we see here there are errors, we became more tolerant to the issues because, uh, for example, I know that uh, I know many people who was uh, uh, maybe years ago, they were saying, oh, okay, so I was trying to use this service and I was using it for a couple hours and then it sends a rare error to me. So it's a bad system. Now, uh, when I talking to these people and I see that, okay, so some error message pops up again. Uh, okay, so it don't work this time. So let me try again. So <clears throat> uh, people when dealing with the systems will need to understand that uh, the failure is always somewhere inside. So somewhere inside, there's always something what is not working properly. As an engineers, as a designers, we need to create the systems, which even with uh, some level of internal problems can operate and deliver the user experience, customer experience, deliver productivity. And uh, as a users, we need to understand that it's our responsibility to make the system safe and make them operate properly. So in many aspects, it depends on us, how we're using the systems and uh, are, they, uh, uh, are they actually uh, safe for us? Are they safe for our data? Are they safe for, uh, for the operations and so on? So we need to be mindful. We don't need to just uh, know like monkeys, uh, push the buttons and without care about what we are doing. Right now we are living in a world of very high complexity. So when everything, almost everything we're dealing with is very complex, even the things which are obvious to us, <clears throat> which we are just using our daily life. And uh, you know, they're always with us like smart bands, uh, phones, tablets, notebooks, this extremely complicated things. 
majority of people who are using them have completely no idea how they build from inside. And uh, my personal experience shows that uh, less people know about what they're dealing with, more careful they became with it. So especially this, <clears throat> this uh, can be easily observed on uh, senior people who are using you know, laptops or mobile phones and they're using it much more carefully that for example, uh, younger people and especially engineers who know how this thing's working because uh, for them it's important to just uh, keep them in a good order in the right order uh, to, to keep them operational for them because they're important for them so uh, i really hope that uh, that was an interesting journey about uh, the complexity and the failures uh, this is uh, pretty much it what i have uh, from uh, from the slides perspective and uh, from the talk for today. So if you have uh, any questions and uh, if you have uh, any ideas you want to share with me, so you can uh, just speak up and uh, talk now or you can post your questions and the comments uh, to the chat. So thank you for the comments which already posted here. I really appreciate this and uh, Especially thanks you, Professor Barbosa, for supporting this project. I know that she will also have a talk on this stage soon. So I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to your talk in April. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you have uh, more questions, you can always contact uh, me uh, even after this event. So uh, we have a contact information on, on our lab website. I will always be glad to hear back the feedbacks and so on. Uh, the video of uh, this presentation will soon will be uh, published on our YouTube channel. So please uh, feel free to watch it uh, there or share with your uh, friends and colleagues. So I will appreciate this also because we need to grow our audience. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, so do we have any questions or comments? Hello, Professor Ivan. How are you? Oh, yeah. Yes, Jorge, Hello. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the yeah. presentation and congratulations yeah. for this project and for the organization. Oh, oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a question related to this, uh, the, the work that we have been working, with developing during the last the last uh, months, uh, related with uh, time series in, and prediction. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you if you believe that this kind of research work related to this time series, analysis of time series and, and prediction uh, is strategic to support the, this kind of system, complex systems, and, may, and mainly if this kind of analysis can be used to support the, the prediction fails and to support, <laughs> to treat this kind of problem because the when we use the history and the, 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 the context information related with the history, I think it's possible to predict and to try to, to detect the fail before the, the occurrence. And, and I think this, this, there is a strong relation between this kind of study, time series and prediction, and complex systems if fails. And please, I would like to, to know about your opinion about this. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. So this this is very related topics. So uh, you know that's uh, what what we also looking at right now. So you we are doing actually very interesting and related to each other things. So with uh, with your work, you are trying to understand the systems uh, as in, in terms of uh, let's say in the context of various data which you're gathering around the systems. Uh, also, when you, when you have a time series, it's actually the history of how things are changing. So sure, in the time series, you can see the previous failures and you can see what kind of reasons lead to these failures. And uh, together with uh, analysis of this data, we can do other different things. For example, one of the very popular concepts right now, which is called digital twin. When we can do mm -hmm. uh, the kind of a shadow copy of a real system to see how it is aligned with 
with how system behaves in the real life. But uh, for many use cases and many, many systems which are doing digital twin, they are based only on a time series data. So they're trying to analyze them, use the machine learning, you know, to see the prediction trends, to detect anomalies, which is very important to detect anomalies. But uh, right now, one of the projects which we are doing together with SD Cloud and SD Lytica, our projects, we are trying to build the digital twin with the system dynamics model of the system inside it. So we will have a model which is running in real time. And uh, this model behavior will be com constantly compared with the real system. So we will see the deviations. We will see, for example, that, okay, so if the system behaves like a model for some time, and then we'll see that some parameters start changing differently, it means that something changed here. So this is the moment where maybe some failure happens. Maybe it will was not, not noticeable by end users of the system because it was a hidden failure. So system still operates well. But for example, uh, we can see that response times for some service start growing. So system is still working, but something already uh, happening wrong inside. So this can be detected by, for example, uh, just analyzing the time series data. Yes, because we have, have a history of response times, so we can see that, yeah, it's growing. But also with the model, we can uh, actually see more, you know, complex deviations of the parameters. So we can see that uh, how they are behaving in the wrong way as a system. So this is one of the biggest uh, topic we are right now going to wrap up in our lab as a project. So this is a digital twin with the system dynamics model. So this is what we are working on. Uh, we, we are actually waiting for some level of maturity in, uh, in, in SDLytica because we need this time series analytic engines. We need these gears uh, to put in place because we already have everything ready on the modeling side. So the modeling core inside SD Cloud is ready completely. So we are waiting for to wrap up uh, what we're doing with SDLytica to actually uh, work on this. So yes, you're absolutely right. So this this actually the way how we can monitor and predict the failures and address the failures at early. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we are actually have already pretty long session. So if anybody will have other questions or comments regarding uh, this topic or our projects or whatever. So please uh, share your thoughts uh, with us. We'll always be glad to get in touch. I was really happy to see so many people join today. We have up to 60 participants during the, during the event. And I think that uh, for the first talk, it's, uh, it's a really, Big amount of uh, uh, big amount of people. I was very happy to see uh, that uh, a lot of registrations for the fr from the places which I was not actually expected, uh, and uh, I don't have direct contacts there. So I think that uh, uh, people just found our projects uh, in LinkedIn or Twitter. So a special thanks to them for joining and for their attention. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you everybody very much for joining and hope to see you again uh, on this lectures uh, on the next sessions. Please stay tuned uh, and we will announce the next presentations uh, soon. Thank you everybody. Thank you for your attention and joining. Have a good day and evening.